Hi, in this video, I'm going to be discussing the transport layer. This happens to be layer four in the OSI model. And thanks again to Cisco, and I'm using their notes. And without further ado, let us begin. So what is the purpose of the transport layer? Well, the transport layer is kind of a relay station between the top higher layers, session presentation application. These are the layers that are mainly related to the user initiating communication. Maybe you're sending an email, maybe you on Amazon's website, whatever it is, you use applications or your software, and that eventually goes down the stack and dictates to the transport layer by saying, look, I need to send this information over the internet or over a network. Please send it according to such and such a protocol. Now, in this video, I'm going to discuss those protocols, and they happen to be called TCP and UDP. All right, then the transport layer prepares the communication, prepares the application data for transport over the network. You see, after you've created your communication, now why we say created communication is that it's the human who initiates all these uh, communication um activities like you might want to stream a YouTube video or do your internet banking, whatever it is, then you will then be using uh, various software and that software needs to get to another host or a server, another server on a network. So the transport layer is the relay station between all the software that you're using and the lower three networking layers. Now, the lower three layers are called network, data link, and physical. And these three layers are, are specifically created or specifically pertain to sending and receiving of your data. So the transport layer oversees that process. So it's kind of the manager of the um, transporting of your data across uh, a network and also to receive the data from other uh, clients or another server on a network. So the purpose of the transport layer is the overall end-to-end -end transfer of application data. So you've got applications on your computer, various applications. You might have software such as Mozilla. You might have an email client. You might have uh, even PowerPoint. You might use whatever software you use that needs to access a network. And yes, PowerPoint also accesses a network. It's got a built-in dictionary. It's got a built and, and Microsoft Word, for example, also has access to a network. Sometimes you want to load a template or whatever it is. So these device, these um, uh, applications or software, whatever you want to call it, require access to a network. And it also receives information from other networks. For example, your email. When you receive email, how does that get to this email client? Why does the email not find itself in the Mozilla window? So this is the role of the transport layer in tracking these uh, individual conversations or these individual communications that you are sending or having. Whether you're sending information or receiving it, the job of the transport layer is to make sure that it can track the individual communication between applications on the source between the source and destination. So the transport layer is an extremely important uh, um, layer in the OSI model. And I'll just give you some more uh, theory about that. So any host may have multiple applications that are communicating across a network. Now, as I've shown you, you might have multiple communications. You might have your email, you might have your Mozilla. Now, if you just have a look at the Mozilla window, I'm looking at the FIFA World Rankings. This is a form of communication. I'm also looking at Amazon. This is a form of communication. So you can see there's some, some uh, uh, SD cards. I'm communicating with Amazon server. I might be downloading software. I'm downloading Wireshark from Wireshark.org. This is a form of communication. So the transport layer's job is to manage all these communication um, initiations by the user, and the user is me. And when I click here and I say Windows installer and I want to download the software, well, at Wireshark, they are going to send me the file. So how, how does my computer get that file and make sure it comes through to the right place? For example, I... Um, I have downloaded the Wireshark and uh, it's already uh, been um, installed on my computer. But how did it come through to this uh, application? 
why didn't the the software uh, from say um, uh, my email client get the the Wireshark the software I was downloading see because the transport layer makes sure that the information or the datagrams coming back must go back to the same application that requested it so it keeps track of these individual conversation and another extremely important uh, feature of the transport layer is that it needs to segment data and it manages each piece of data. Now, this will make sense as we go along in the video. And the reason why we segment data is if we've got huge amounts of data, for example, maybe you have a YouTube video, and there you go, and I want to stream this YouTube video. I made this YouTube video, and this video is over a gig in size. Now, I can't expect my computer to only stream this video because then I won't be able to browse Amazon, get email, or whatever else I'm doing. So the, what the computer does is it chops up the, the data stream into smaller, more manageable um, protocol data units or datagrams uh, so that it can be uh, more um, easily managed over the network. And the reason why I say that is because if you take a huge stream of data and a few packets are lost in the middle, well then do you need to resend the entire one gig file? Well, yes. So if you chop it up and make it into smaller packets or more smaller um, parcels, well then whatever's lost can just be resend. You don't have to resend an entire gig. You can just send a few kilobytes which were lost. So this is some of the benefits of segmenting data. Now I will show you the, um, the slides which uh, will demonstrate that. Now, as I said, your devices have multiple communication initiations. For example, maybe you have an IP phone. That's a form of communication. Maybe you are streaming video. Maybe you're using Skype. Maybe you're doing internet banking. These are all multiple communications. And this, this IP phone, it uses an application. There is software that runs that IP phone. And it has to get that data ready in a way that the transport layer can deal with it. So the transport layer then moves this data. Okay, obviously it goes down the stack. Now this is the TCP model of the um, stack. Obviously it goes down the stack and it sends it. And then on the other side, the receiver will then receive it. And the transport layer once again has to reorganize that uh, information and prepare it for the application layer, knowing that it's for the IP phone. So the tr um, application layer tracks the individual conversations as I was saying and it also segments data because if we're streaming a video we can't send the entire video in one go we need to chop it up and then send it in what we call packets or frames or data grams and we've got to be careful of the nomenclature here because if you're on layer two we call it frames if you're on layer three we call it packets if we're on layer four we call it datagrams and if you're on layer one we call it bits ones and zeros okay so moving along the transport layer then when it receives this chopped up um, uh, all this information it's then got to reorganize it and it's got to um, reassemble these uh, these uh, datagrams into a format that the various software or applications can use. So here are some uh, very effective slides just showing you how there's your computer and you might be doing several things. You might be using um, maybe using Google Chrome and you've got several windows open and then you might be um, on your inst uh, inst sending an instant message you might also be using email you might be streaming a video and can you see the color coding of these arrows so now all of these applications require access to a network because in order for you to send and receive email you're going to be connecting to an email server isn't it i mean the email doesn't isn't uh, received from your computer the email is received at your email server and if you're using uh, Gmail, well, then it's received at Google's server. And if you're using Outlook, well, it's well, if you're using uh, Outlook, it's probably received at Microsoft, unless you have a company that is uh, running Exchange Server. Then uh, maybe you've got a company uh, server, but still, that company server is on a network, whether it is a local network 
or a remote network over a WAN, a wide area network, it's still got to leave your computer, go to another computer, a server, and then come back to your computer. And that is the role of the transport layer, making sure that all these individual conversations are kept in tow. So if we move on here, you'll see that here are all the return packets coming back. You can see there's blue, and then it's going, that's an IM packet, and there's blue, there's an, another IM parcel. And I'm, I'm interchanging the terms packet, parcel, um, frame, because it really depends on which layer we are, we are working on. But since we're working on layer 4, I suppose I should be using the term datagram. So here is a, the um, datagram coming through. There's another datagram. There's another datagram. And, and the transport layer must send all of those well, and also prepare them for this application. And if you're looking in the orange section here, then this looks like a website, a web, and it actually looks like Cisco's website. Um, then these are all the orange datagrams, which are going to be sent there. And the yellow are going to be sent here. Now, just to highlight to you that you might have multiple websites, web pages open. Here I'm looking at the tennis, uh, the recent Wimbledon. Now, if I click here on Anderson Reach's career high rankings, how does the computer know to show it in this tab? Why is it not merging into the FIFA tab? For example, if I uh, click here and I want to get some more information about uh, Germany's uh, soccer performance, how come it displays here? Why doesn't it merge in here? Well, that's the job of the transport layer in connection with your application layer. The transport layer knows to send the, um, the, the data, because this is data, it wasn't there before. It came from the site called www.sport24.co.za. This came from their server and it found its way into one, two, three, four, fifth tab of my Mozilla um, web browser. So that's the transport layer. The transport layer has to track each individual conversation and make sure that it goes into the correct place. So there we go. There come these uh, uh, datagrams, and they've got to be sent into the right place. And that job is the uh, that job is very important. Otherwise, this person streaming a video would have some of his data going to an IM, and then your email would be merged into web pages. So how does the transport layer do this? How does the transport layer manage to track the individual conversations? Well, it comes down to a few aspects, and one of them is called port numbers. And I'm going to uh, discuss that, but I'm just uh, whetting your appetite a little bit. All right, now keep in mind that these uh, datagrams that are segmented here were once streams of data. For example, if we go back, I don't know if I've got a picture. Yeah, you were, you were ex uh, requesting uh, maybe some video. Now, that video... Uh, um, is from maybe Google's server, maybe you're on YouTube. So that video is leaving uh, Google in segments. You see, here we go. There, it, it is also leaving Google in the same way. In the same token, here you may be on a web page. There we go. And you're looking at this uh, web page, Anderson's rankings. Well, when it left www.sport24, it followed the same set of rules. So that means that the, the sender which happens to be uh, Sport24, or maybe you're on Amazon and you're looking at this uh, 512 gig poorly rated um, micro SD card. Well, this information is leaving Amazon server. So Amazon server also follows these same rules. It will segment the data and then send it in datagrams. So it's not like it just happens on your local computer. This is a rule across all devices that are co communicating over a network that uh, aspire to the OSI model, which literally means most devices. So that means servers, um, mobile phones, uh, laptops, uh, computers. So most uh, computers, sorry, most devices uh, operate in this format. So here come the segmented pack, uh, datagrams possibly from Google or in here from email, maybe this came from uh, Microsoft and maybe you're on a telephone call to someone in a different country, maybe they're in Australia and maybe it comes from their computer, never mind a server, their computer. Well, here comes all the data segmented in the same format that your computer 
also segmented. So if this is getting confusing, what I'm trying to bring across is that your computer and the server or the sender and the receiver follow the same set of rules to segment the data. So it's not like it's something that's just happening locally or on your computer. This is happening everywhere. If you go and plug in your laptop in Japan or you go to Australia or you go to United States or you're in Mexico, it follows the same set of rules. And that is one of the reasons why computers work everywhere. So you don't have to worry when you go travel to another country, well, will my computer work or will I be able to get my email? Of course you will, because this is a universal set of rules. So here we go. We've got this information which has been segmented. Can you see how all the different conversations have been chopped up and multiplexed? This is the word, multiplex. Multiplex means we've combined them with other uh, uh, data and each is individual in that it's got a header and a footer and a header is a bunch of uh, fields that tell the various uh, networking devices what to do with the the, the the uh, packet and I will uh, discuss that shortly and then what happens is once it arrives at your computer your computer's got to um, send it to the correct places so how does it know that well each one of these datagrams has information in the header telling the layer 4 well and layer 3 by the way it's telling all the layers of the OSI model as it goes through the the layers of your network stack what to do with this datagram and eventually it gets to the transport layer and the transport layer knows the individual conversations and where the data must be sent. Okay, there is also some error checking that takes place. So the transport layer is responsible for not only tracking the individual conversations, it's also responsible for segmenting or breaking a data stream into smaller clusters or smaller parcels. It is also uh, responsible for reassembling these small clusters back into a data stream so that you may view the web page in a um, clear and, and, and uh, predictable format. And its lastly, uh, uh, its most important role is identifying the different applications. For example, here comes a green datagram. The transport layer must know that this datagram was for this application. And here's a blue one, and the transport layer must know this must go to the instant messaging software. So the transport layer is, is in contact with the various software. And when I say software, I mean at the back of your software, the back end, the things that we don't have access to, run services. And those services are, in, are, are, are working um, with the uh, OSI layers in order to get the data prepared to be sent out of your computer and received from other computers. So the back end of the software is working with the OSI model. So here we've got Outlook, here we've got Mozilla, here we've got Internet Explorer. These uh, uh, softwares are, are working hand in hand with the OSI model, uh, the OSI layers, and the transport layer is told by the software what format the data must be sent as. And that's a very important point. So we'll come to that now, now. I think it's coming up shortly. All right. So just to summarize, the transport layer must establish a session. It must ensure that the uh, data was not lost and there was reliable delivery. Although this is dependent on the protocol used. Because not all communication over a network is reliable. And that'll make sense as soon as we go to the slide on TCP and UDP. And then we have something called same order delivery. Again, this is also protocol dependent. What this means is that if you are um, receiving your data and the order of the data is very important. It's very important that, for example, here on a web page, that this bit stream... Remember, this might say price $349 is really represented by ones and zeros, which came in a datagram from Amazon to me. So this is ones and zeros. It's very important that this is placed in this correct part of the page. And it's very important that the page is built according to the 
rules set up on the, if you look at the HTML code, you'll see that it has to be built up in a certain way. Well, it doesn't matter if this line arrives after this line, even though this line is first, as long as the software knows or um, Firefox knows the, to reassemble it and put it over there. Well, the same goes with the uh, with the with the receiving of data. As long as the uh, software knows that this datagram should be before another datagram, well, then it is able to order it. And how would you order it? Well, obviously, the data needs to be numbered. So there's a numbering system called sequence numbers, which the, the transport layer uses to put the data back in the same order. Now, you might be wondering, well, why isn't it received in the same order in the first place? Well, the reason for that is that data may, these, the, the frames as they leave your computer may take different paths. It all depends on the network loading. If you look at a network, let's just have a look at a... a If we have a look at images showing what what the internet mostly looks like, um, for example, let's see. Okay, I've done a poor search here, but a routing that's a better a better model. Here we go. Okay, so you might be sitting. Let's uh, zoom in here. You might be sitting on this section of a network, and your first set of frames now i'm saying i'm using the word frames because now we're on layer two because the data is now ready to leave your computer it leaves as a frame and well it leaves as bits but it's uh, it's packaged as a frame so it leaves here so maybe the first 17 frames go this way to this to this side of the network and maybe your receiver sitting here but then this this part of the network is suddenly very highly loaded because people over here are also using this part. Well, then maybe frame nine, 18 to 33 go this way. And then frame 34 happens to go this way. And frame 35 happens to go this way. And they all are received in different order at the receiver. So what happens? Well, the transport layer has to reorder that put it into the correct order as long as it is using the protocol called TCP. So the transport layer makes sure that the data can be ordered. So that is one of the features of the transport layer is it can reorder. It can also manage the uh, rate at which data leaves your computer and it's called flow control. Now I don't know if you remember in the old days we used to do uh, used to copy a file Maybe you copied a file from one folder to another. Then Windows brought up a copy. Um, let's see if we can find it. Windows 2000. Right, I don't know if you recall that when you're copying files, especially in the old days, on earlier versions of Windows, you see there it is. This is what we got. And then it used to tell us how much time is remaining. Well, that uh, uses a process called windowing. And what happens is it first has to test the the uh, bandwidth of the channel before it can give you a time. Now, from Windows 7, the window, the time got more accurate. I don't know if you recall, in these days, it used to say, uh, it, would, it used to start copying and say, 10, uh, wait, one hour left. Then it immediately, literally a second later, you'd say, 10 seconds left. You'd be like, okay, how did you go from one hour to one to 10 seconds in, in the space of a second? So this is the some of the uh, improvements that uh, Windows 7 and up has had in that it is better at predicting the time. And how it does that is it measures. I don't know if you noticed, it doesn't give you the time immediately. It first sends packets and tests the bandwidth. And it sends maybe uh, 10 packets and then says, okay, it received them Perfectly. Then it'll say, okay, let's try 100 packets. And then, oh, it received them perfectly. And it's like, okay, let's try 1,000. And they say, no, no, we only received 945. And it says, okay, based on receiving 945 packets a second, I can work out the time. And that is called windowing. And that relates to flow control. We need to uh, work out how much data can be sent across a network. And this is another feature of the transport layer in that it does. Uh, deal with the flow of the data. So that's flow control, manages data delivery if there's congestion on the host. All right. So coming to the two different protocols, this is transport layer protocols, we use one called, I think we've got a slide here, TCP 
and another one called UDP. Now, these are quite different. They're different because UDP is a very simple, uh, much simpler protocol than TCP. Just looking at the header, you can see how there are less fields. Now, I know that uh, when people look at this, they don't know what am I looking at. What is bit zero? What is all these things? Why are there squares here? Is this a header? It says here 20 bytes. It says TCP segment. Here it says TCP and UDP headers. What is a header? Okay, so in the same way that if you've got a Word document, let's have a look at that. Uh, there we go. And you can put something here. You can see it says a header. It's kind of at the top. And then you will write your, your maybe you're writing a letter, uh, who writes letters anymore but anyway dear john blah 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 well this is your data and maybe you even place a picture here now the header is the thing above the data and the footer is the thing below the data so if you look here you'll see this is a header and this is also a header from another protocol so here we have a header for the TCP protocol, and this header has something called source port, destination port, sequence number. Now, the sequence number tells the transport layer on all the computers, all the computers that get the data, the order of the, um, the packets, the, the order of the datagrams which they must be put back into. So this happens to be sequence number 32. Now, that does not mean it's the 32nd uh, datagram, by the way. It, do it definitely doesn't mean that. And you'll see why shortly, why these uh, numbers do not necessarily, if it's, if it's number 1010, it doesn't mean that you've received 1009 uh, datagrams already. It doesn't mean that. So I will explain that shortly. This is a random number, but thereafter, once you've set, once the computer has given it this random number, thereafter it's not random. So this might be 32, might be the first um, uh, sequence number, but thereafter it has to follow 33, 34, 35. So this could be 1000, but then the next datagram sent has to be 1001, 1002. Okay, so that's what I mean by random. Okay, I will get into more detail because I am going to still explain the three-way handshake shortly. All right, so getting back to what we're looking at here. What is this? Okay, so I realize that this is not easy to understand when you're looking at it like this. Where is the source port? Where is this destination port? Isn't data serial? Isn't it in a in a in a series a serial format? How come this is next to that? I know this thing looks confusing, eh? So let's just have a look at this. You can see that there are two headers here. The first one is the TCP header, and the second one is the UDP header. Now I've got a series of pictures here which might help. Now the first thing we need to know is that. This info, all this information is leaving your computer in some way, whether it is Ethernet or wireless, Wi-Fi or 3G or 4G. Let's just use the Ethernet. It's leaving your computer in some way, whether it's over the air or through copper or glass, fiber optic, it doesn't matter. So here is a, an Ethernet cable. Now can you see it plugs into this port here. So what is coming out of this cable are ones and zeros. Ones and zeros. There, there's the binary sequence. This is a, like an Ethernet signal. So here you see square wave. Uh, and I wouldn't call this. Look, it's it's partially square. As you can see, it's got some ringing there. The ringing there. That's called ringing. It's got some uh, undershoot, some overshoot. It's got some noise here. But nevertheless, the uh, up uh, the. Um, amplifiers on in the network card know how to deal with this and this would be considered a one and this would be considered a zero so what i'm trying to bring to your attention here is that it's a stream of data as you can see look this is serial serial meaning moving uh, in one line so here we've got this data leaving your um, ethernet cable there we go through say one of these uh, course and just by the way this is um, uh, following a standard you can't just make these cables in any old way the the uh, color coding is important it's orange white orange green white blue blue white green brown white brown so you've got to pay attention to the standard remember that everything in, in computing follows a standard you can't just say oh i'm going to put these colors in any old way no no it doesn't work that way they are color coded and that relates to several aspects of its performance and whether it'll even work so Coming back here, here you've got this bit stream. 
So how do you get this from, say, this, this header? Well, you've got to think of it in terms of, uh, you've got to look at it like almost like in a sideways fashion. That's why I've chosen this uh, image. Can you see there's the header? There's the headers and there's the data. So you could imagine square wave, you know, 11000111, that represents your data. And there's your TCP header, which is mostly this. And there it is. So you've got to think of version being like kind of the first bits, uh, type of service somewhere there. And then and the router or the, the um, network layers in the other devices know, okay, the first bit started here. And then I know, okay, this was the version number. Okay, this is the length. Okay, this is the type of service, the total length. Okay, this is the, the identification. This is the time to live, source IP address, destination. IP. So it knows which part of the bit stream represents which part of this header. And I think a lot of people get confused. Why is this thing in a, like almost like a, a, a rectangle format okay so there we go the header is okay the the head the datagram is there which includes all this stuff and there's the, the the data and you might be confused by why there's a header and then another header and another header and, and then i've got another picture to explain that where is that if you look at the different layers on the in the osr model you can see that each layer adds its own signaling information you see here's the data right at the top that's that's kind of you well i say you is because like we creating this data okay yes ai can also create the data but i'm just talking in terms i'm talking to people now so you send an email there you go you go an email and you send an email that's a data dear john i'll be late for the meeting okay so that's data but then that data from that um uh, 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 email client will, or email software needs to be packaged in a way that the next layer can deal with it. So at the back of the data, sorry, at the, at the back of the email server, it puts on some signaling information. And then that's the application protocol because this is dealing with your software. And don't get confused by the, the, the layer application and thinking that this application is that application. No, this is the application layer which interfaces with the services that are running at the back of your applications. I know it can be confusing. Eh? All right, so what you need to know is the reason, one of the reasons why it's called the application is because the layer that deals with your software or your applications or your apps. All right, then, it, then need, the, the data needs to go down a layer to the presentation layer. And we will get to what the presentation layer does and the session layer and so forth. But can you see that this layer also has a bunch of protocols and there it adds its header. And then it goes down another layer. Remember, it's supposed to leave your computer. Remember, you're sending an email. It's got to go down all these layers onto the network and then it goes to the client and back up to his uh, um to, to this client here. So now we're on the presentation. It's got its own protocols. Now we're on the session layer. Own protocols, you see. And now we the transport layer. There we are. You see, transport layer and its own header. So believe it or not, inside the data of the transport layer already has a whole bunch of um, headers from other layers. Just telling you how much signaling... Um, uh, headers they are in a single datagram that has to move across a network it's quite extraordinary okay so then it goes down another layer to the network layer and you can see there come the ip addresses and then it goes down another layer to the data link layer this is the layer of ethernet then they come the mac addresses and then it goes down another layer and then there's some further signaling uh, information and then it gets ready to be sent so that is one of the reasons why we have so many headers because each header is related to a certain protocol on a certain layer of the OSI uh, model, OSI stack. So for da data to leave your computer and to come back to your computer, it's got a whole bunch of, where's that slide? Got a whole bunch of headers that have to be dealt with so that that little piece of data can go to the right place uh, in the right order and, and for the right person. Okay, so let us continue now. This is the TCP header. Here we go. It's got a source port and a destination port. Now this 
porting, I'm sorry, this port numbering, not porting, this port numbering is what allows TCP to know where the packet is going to. Remember, you can't send something to nobody. You have to send it to somebody. So this is a source port and this is a destination port. A source port is you. You're the source of this information. If I'm sending an email, I'm the source. So that is my address. Who am I sending it to? Well, that's the destination. That happens to be the client's address. Then we look at the UDP. What do you notice? Also source port and destination port. So what is that telling you? That both TCP and UDP need addresses. Otherwise, where is this datagram going to? We don't know where it's going to go to. Right, so there we go to uh, sequence number. Now look, sequence number here and acknowledgement number here, but not here, showing me that TCP is interested in ordering of packets while UDP doesn't care. Can you see there's no sequence number. If, packet, if, the, if the first packet that left your computer arrived at the uh, destination last, well, so be it. There's nothing that UDP can do to reorder it because it's not listed in the header of which packet was should be first because there's no numbering. So that works on something called a best effort. So if you want to know what services use this, this protocol called UDP, well, DNS, domain name systems, use a UDP protocol, video streaming, voice over IP. Why would they use UDP? And I'll tell you why. Because... Let's let let me say a word now to you. Let me say the word hello. Okay. Now the word hello is made up of syllables. Ha, like hell, oh, hello. Right. Now when this word this word hello is has to be digitized. Remember, all communication in your computer takes place digitally. It has to go from analog to digital conversion. Remember, analog is a varying waveform, while digital is literally just ones and zeros. So it has to be the analog waveform has to be quantized and put into a digital format. Now, this information, like the word hello, has to be represented by a sequence of bits, one, one, zero, 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 whatever it may be. Okay, so it has to be digitized. Now, imagine that the word hello could be equivalent to three datagrams. Maybe the ha is a datagram, l is a datagram, and o is a datagram. So those are three individual little datagrams that leave your computer in order for the word hello to be um, uh, digitized and, and sent on a network. So it's three frames leaving your computer to the person you're having a conversation to should receive ha, l, lo as three individual datagrams. Okay, so what happens if one of those goes missing? Let's put the ha, the ha when missing. Now, the person receiving this uh, uh, IP phone call, who's on the other side of this IP phone call, only hears, hello. There's no ha. There's a hello. Do you think they would be able to make out the word hello? Most probably. And do you think there would be any purpose in pausing the, the, the bit stream in order to get the ha back in the, in the, in the right place by, by asking your, your uh, IP software to resend the, the ha? No, because then the conversation will have a lot of pauses in it. Because what will happen is you would be saying, oh, so I went to the shops today and then I saw the uh, man at the shop and I said to him, and at this point you would say, hello, but then that one packet, that one uh, datagram got lost. So now you, the IP phone on the other side is not going to, 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 to um, play that, that, um, that sound until it gets the huh, packet. So then it'll be, and then I said to him, pause. So it will destroy the continuity in conversation if we try and pause and try and scavenge and find where did that packet go and resend it in order to just get the ha. Huh. So the reason what I'm, what I'm trying to tell you is that it works on a best effort and, mo and for most part, for the most part, we can get along or get by without getting every single Datagram. So some datagrams get lost and it's actually okay because you can still make out what I'm saying if I say hello. You know that's probably hello. And no, it's not a social media network uh, that thought they were going to take out Facebook. You remember hello. But anyway, so another f uh, uh, example is video streaming. If you are streaming maybe a live soccer game and I'm just going to use 
uh, YouTube as an example, although this is not a very good example, but just imagine this is a live game or a live uh, video you're watching. Like literally it's satellites coming via satellite or via your fiber optic directly. It's happening live. Okay, now can you see that I'm opening and closing a door here, right? Now, can you see there's like pixels here? All of these colors on your screen are made up of something called pixels. Now imagine like a, a, a cluster of pixels is 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 a datagram so let's 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 look at that 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 gray part there now let's just skip ahead a bit and you can see that once i've skipped ahead now once i've skipped ahead a bit do you think there's any purpose in bringing back that gray door um, handle or, or opener and putting it back here no once it's happened it's happened there's no point in in trying to retransmit uh, this image over here there's no no point if those pixels or datagrams went missing along the way as long as the bulk of the picture arrived well it's fine if a few pixels gray pixels were not shown here it's fine and in the same way as if a few pixels uh, of this uh, um, vinyl or this vinyl here were not here you wouldn't even notice so that is the point, is that we don't need to transmit all data reliably. Now you might be wondering, why am I introducing this word reliably? You see, when we have a sequence number, we can know for sure the ordering of the, um, the, 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 the segments because it's numbered. We can put it back in the right number. And by knowing the number, we can confirm with the receiver if they received that number. And by confirming with the receiver if they received it, we can now say, I sent it, therefore it was reliably sent, which means that I can confirm that it was received. That's why it's called reliable. Reliable means you know it's going to happen. I'm like, oh, my car is reliable. Therefore, I know it's going to start today and drive me to, uh, well, I will drive it to, to work. So that's an example of reliable. Reliable means that you have some sort of knowing that it has happened or it will happen. And if the receiver never got the packet, well, then you also know. So it's still reliable because then you know they never got it. So then you've got confirmation that they never got it. Therefore, you can say, all right, I must resend it. You see, you understand what, what the word reliable is, is meaning in this context. Okay, so it's called reliable because we know if it got there. And we also know if it didn't get there. Okay, whereas the UDP, we don't know if it gets there and we don't know if it, uh, if it doesn't get there. It's the best effort. Well, I tried our best and hopefully you get it. All right. So we've got some other features here. We've got a window, urgent, check some. This is for error correction options. And there's the data. There's your application data. And in the UDP, you can see there's the application data. There's the data. So you can see it's a smaller protocol, a simpler protocol, and a faster protocol because there's less overhead, which means there's less processing. Remember that excuse me, TCP had to reorder these segments and that takes time and processing power and CPU usage, whatever you want to call it. Okay, so moving along. All right, now we come to the very important section on how, do, how does uh, the transport layer make sure that each uh, data, uh, datagram or segment goes to the right place? For example, I showed you earlier that I'm looking at this soccer. Oh, sorry, this tennis. Here we go. I was looking at the soccer, but here is the tennis. I'm looking at this tennis. And then I'm also looking at the soccer. Now, I'm tired of looking at Germany's uh, uh, results. Let's now, let's look at a different set of results. Let's look at Denmark. Now, can you see this was loaded? Why did this come here and not to Anderson's page here? Well, the process there links to something called port numbers. Now, in the earlier example, I showed a computer having a web session open with a internet chat, for example, maybe it's IM, internet messaging. And then there was another uh, communication using the web browser. And then lastly, let's take the email. So we've got three independent remember the word it's it, these have nothing to do with each other these are three independent communications that are happening multitask on this client or this computer here now in order for this to take place 
we, the transport layer assigns port numbers so that this um, segment, well, where it'll be called a frame when it leaves your computer, goes to the various uh, servers on the internet or on your local network in the correct port. For example, if you are going onto a web page, it will be port 80. So if you're going to www.cisco.com, well, the transport layer knows that it's web information, so it will assign a port number as the destination. It will say 80. And if it's IM, it will assign a port number 531. And this will probably be told to it by the application layer. For example, it will be told to it by the various software. Now, in your email, maybe you're using POP3. Well, then it will assign port 110. Now, you might be wondering, like, where do these port numbers come from? Like, How did it know that it must be uh, 113, for example? Well, there is an exhaustive list of port numbers. So you can go to Wiki, and you can see the list of TCP and UDB port numbers. And you'll see there are 65,535 port numbers, which works out to be 2 to the power of 16 minus 1. Okay, 2 to the power of 16 then minus one. And you can see that each port number stands for a particular um, uh, service or protocol or software. And you might be wondering, but why did I say all those things? Okay, let's take port number 20. Can you see that the service or the protocol offered is file transfer protocol? I'm sure you've heard of an FTP. And Wiki is explaining it as a standard network protocol used for the transfer of files between a computer and a server on a network. So if you are up, uh, uploading to an FTP server, well, guess what? Your FileZilla software, whatever software you're using in order to, to enact this, will know, okay, I'm going to port 20. So it'll attach a port 20 into the uh, datagram's uh, header. All right, and then here we go to... Um, FTP, another uh, port, FTP, again, 21. Now you see 22, SSH, secure sh shell. Talnet happens to be 23. So these are already reserved. You may not assign these. These are not assigned by us. This the software assigns us. This is done via the application layer's uh, um, software. So if you're using Outlook or whatever uh, email service you're using, it will assign the SMTP port number automatically. You don't have to do it. Oh, okay, sometimes it's not set properly and we do it manually. But what I'm saying is you don't, it's not your decision to say, oh, um, let me put 23 there. No, no, the, the port number has already been defined. You don't have to define it. It's officially done. So if you're using SMTP, well, then you know it's port 25. And as we go down, you'll see all the services or protocols that are already listed here. Now, here you see 80. This is the port number that we use to access or request web, um, web pages from on the internet. So this is port 80. Now, it doesn't mean that just because you or your, just because your software allocated port 80 to your um, datagram doesn't mean that the server at... Uh, at uh, say fifa.com is going to allow it it's just that because it knows it to be a web request or a get request for a web server it puts 80 when that request comes to fifa fifa will uh, have port 80 open on their server and it will see this request this incoming request and it will either accept it on port 80 or it may even forward it onto another port just by the way but for, for our from our side as the um the the sender because remember we are sending the request we just see it as port 80 what fifa does with that with that on their side is irrelevant to us and it's the same on on uh, on, on say this www.sport24 to access this on the internet i will be saying port 80 but what this uh, company sport24 will do on their side is up to them they they may um, forward that to another server on another port just by the way now that might be getting a bit complicated so i might be confusing the issue here so let's just get back to the basics here you want to access a web page you'll send a get request the get request is a request for the web uh, to to communicate with a web server and thereafter it will accept it and then you can get the web page so you'll send it on port 80 because it is a web service so that it's already been defined as 80 
Here you see uh, pop3 happens to be emailing 110. Now let's just go and check that to see if I'm right. Uh, 110 should be, um, where is it? There we go. Post Office Protocol 3. And here we see all these port numbers. So these are already set. Now up to about, I think, a thousand. Let's just check. Up to about 1,000, yeah, up, not about, up to 1,023. That is the uh, first cluster of port numbers. And you can see they're all itemized here. And this is the well-known port numbers, well-known ports. Then it goes to 1,030, uh, 1,023. And then we get the registered ports. Now, these are still mostly reserved. You'll even see uh, some, there's QuickTime streaming server. Uh, VLC. You can see that a lot of these uh, um, protocols you're probably familiar with. IBM. Anyway, moving down. Now let's go to the ones that are of interest to us. All the way down. You can see how many port numbers. There's a BitTorrent port number. And if you know these port numbers, you can also uh, fault trace and, and analyze data on a network because you could see, oh, this has uh, got that port number after the IP address. Oh, so this uh, client on the network happens to be streaming using or, or um, downloading torrents because he has BitTorrent. All right. Anyway, coming down here. And then we come to this section here, which is dynamic private or uh, uh, dynamic uh, ports. And you can see there are 49,152 all the way up to 65,000. These are dynamic port numbers. And you will find that your computer might set or randomly choose ports for, from this in this range. And uh, I will explain that to you shortly how it does that and why it does that. So let's get back to the, the port number. So... What you need to realize is that there is a destination port number and a source port number. Just like there is a destination IP address and a source IP address. Now, many people get confused and they think, no, there's a port number, it's 80. Yes, that is the port number of the Cisco server on the internet that you are trying to access. But when that packet or that frame is coming back to you, it's not coming back via port 80. It's coming back. It's leaving Cisco server maybe via port 80. But it's not coming back to your computer through port 80. And that's the trick. That's the part where people get confused. So let's just have a look here. They've written it somewhere here. And that maybe you are attempting to get to an HTTP web page. And that web page happens to be the IP address 192.168.1.20. Well, if you are attempting to go through the web port then you put colon 80. That, that together, looking like that, is called a socket. When we have the port number and the IP address together, it's called a socket. So that is the server's address. For example, let's say it's Cisco, because he has the Cisco web page. And that is the port that you're attempting to um, access on Cisco's web server. Now, when Cisco replies to you, it's coming back via your public address. Note, I say public. So this happens to be maybe your public address is 192.168.100.48. Um, public address means the address can be seen by everyone on the internet. But look at the port which it's coming back through your computer in. 49,152. Do you see that? You attempted to get a service or a web page from Cisco through their port 80. But when Cisco replied to you, they replied to 49,152. Now, that's what's important. Now, at any time, you can view all the sockets that or all the, um, let's go to uh, all the, the concurrent connections that are taking place on your computer. Now, I will show you that in a second. I just would like to show you the... Oh, here's the port numbers. So as I said, 0 to 1,023 are the well-known. But the ones that I'm now talking about are the 49,152 to the 65. These are the dynamic ports. These are allocated to each um, one of your communications. For example, 
you can see I've got all these windows open. Can you see that? These are all at different web sites. Slideplayer.com, Cisco.com. Okay, I don't know what that is. Um, I don't know what that is. But as you can see, Amazon.com. These are all concurrent connections to one, two, three, four, five, like 12 different web servers on the internet. So these, each one of these must have its own unique port number. And that's why I am, am highlighting all these uh, tabs, showing you that if each one of these has its own port number, then Mozilla knows, okay, data that has this port number must go and populate this tab. Data that's with this port number must populate this um, a tab. So this is one of the mechanisms that the transport layer uses to keep the individual, you see individual, these are all individual. Uh, Amazon cannot see what I'm doing at Wireshark. Yes, I know there's a whole story about cookies and so forth. I, I'm not going to get into that argument. But the point I'm trying to make is that while I'm making a purchase, Amazon is not seeing what I'm currently downloading at at, at Wireshark.org or what I'm looking at at FIFA.com. All right. So these are independent. And this is enabled through allocating of dynamic port numbers. Where's my slide? Yeah, there we go. One by one, so that the TCP layer can uh, uh, receive the, the, the replies from these various web servers and know, okay, 49,151, oh, 52 goes here, or 49,155 goes there, 59 and so forth. So you can at any time view this on your computer using a command prompt uh, window. So I can show you that now. You do the netstat. Uh, here, okay, here they've done it, but I'd like to show you myself. Um, netstat. And then what it will do is it will look at your local address, it will look at the foreign address, and then it will give you the state, whether the connection was established or not. So you see, there you go. So what you're going to see are all the IP addresses. Now, the reason why I wanted to show this is this is my local address, 10.0.0.17. This is the IP address of my local computer. Now, the internet... I mean, the, the, the uh, web servers on the internet cannot see this address, 10.0.0.17. And that, this is the reason why I'm showing it. Because if you log into the router, the router will have its public IP address and it will swap this with the routers. My router on my local network will swap it with its a public address and that is why I wanted to show you the netstat on my local host on the computer that I'm busy working on right now okay so there you go there are all the concurrent connections that I have and these are the different websites that I am on 185.62.19.13 uh, 13.92 these are the addresses and you can see the protocol is even listed there because it would say 80 or, or um HTTPS is a secure uh, port, so we can have a look at that and see if you would like to. We can see that port number. I, I thought it was, yeah, the, the port number is 443. It uh, eluded me for a second there. So what uh, the command prompt has done, it knows that it's a uh, 443. So it's translated it into the protocol. So this would be 443, or maybe... Uh, is it just 443? Yeah, it just would have been 443, and ones that are 80 might just uh, might just convert it to to HTTP, maybe not HTTPS. So anyway, what I'm trying to highlight to you is you see all these tabs that are open. Look, one, two, three, four, five, six. Look at here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Some of these are not web uh, web. Uh, some of these are not uh, these tabs. Some of these are other tabs that I've got open doing other. Um, things on the computer but what I would like to show you is that can you see that independent F 54782 54787 54818 54822 can you see there's a, there's no duplication here 49928 can you see here 49927 uh, 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 four, uh, 56725. You see, these are all different. You, there's no duplication. I can't have 54857 in here, 54857. Uh, That's not going to work. So this is how the 
transport layer make sure that each one of these tabs is independent and now just having a look it is https i was wrong to think that it was from another session these are the https sessions sorry i made a mistake there and if i look at amazon there it's also using https so there we go these are all these sessions that i have running and that's the um the list that i've just shown you boom and you might find that some of these are not shown. Why? Because the uh, connection is no longer established. I could quickly reinvigorate or reconnect all of these. And then you might find that it will uh, come up again. Let's just do that. Um, we might find that we get more. Because some of these links have probably gone uh, dead. Let's just uh, realign these. Right, so now what we should see is even more because this is this is not enough for the amount of tabs that I've got open. Um, but anyway, so you can see what I'm getting at here is as you create communication, well, as you create communication, well, they'll come up on the on that list. You see, as I create conversations, there we go, more and more conversations, well, more and more will be listed here. And the transport layer will just keep tracking all these conversations and you can you might wonder like is there a limit well there is a limit but that limit is very high because i ask you would you i mean it is thousands of concurrent connections because as you can see starting at 40 where is that uh, starting at uh, where is that one the dynamic 49,152 all the way up to 65,000 blah 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 you can see that is more than 10,000 concurrent connections so in, effectively the limit is your processing power of your CPU rather than the amount of port numbers if you know what I mean okay so let's close that now they will be populated it does take some time and let's move on okay so in order for this to take place, we have, we have to have a source and destination port. Now, let me ask you, what is the source port? The source port is you, your port number. What is the destination port? The port at the person or the uh, server you're trying to get service from or contact from. Sequencing, well, we're coming to that. And acknowledgement, we're coming to that. So now you know how the individual conversations are tracked uh, in terms of the port numbering and how the um, conversations or the tabs do not interfere with each other and how the email does not go into the Mozilla and so forth um, by using these port numbers. But I still have not explained to you how are these packets arranged in the correct order. How does TCP handle the ordering of the packets and uh, the datagrams? And there, that comes to something called the three-way handshake but um, before I do this is the three-way handshake but before I do that let's just see the slide here it looks like it's got a very nice animation in terms of just explaining this once one more time just to make sure you are here you're a client one and you're requesting a web page your source port allocated randomly by your TCP layer by the transport layer excuse me happens to be 49,152 you are attempting to get to a web server, therefore you are trying to get to port 80. There goes your request. This web server um, receives it on port 80, and then it will reply to you. See, there's your destination port. This is the summary. This is the destination port. Don't worry what's happening on this side here. This is your destination port, and this is your source port, the port from where the request is coming from. And here is what is happening at the server. The server receives your request and replies, HTTP response, on port 80, its port, sending it to 49,552. Uh, it's replying to that port. So it is replying to an IP address as well. It's just not shown here. And that port number. So when it gets to the router here or your, or your computer, it knows which IP address, which com com client to go to and which port port then the transport layer knows okay 49152 was linked to mozilla tab number 16 and there we go 
You see? All right. Now, let's just look at what's happening on the other side here. It's showing you that a server may have several ports open at once. It's, we don't just uh, assume that just because it's a web server, it can't absorb or uh, receive other ports. As you see, there are over a thousand well-known ports. So this server, maybe it's in your company, might have several ports open. For example, client number two is not looking for a web uh, um, page. It's looking for some sort of email service. There it says port 25 SMTP. Remember, that is the email service. So this client, at the same time, while you're looking at its uh, the server's port 80, this client is looking at port 25. So I'm just showing you that these things can happen at uh, simultaneously, and we can be accessing different ports. Just like on your computer, you might have port 49,152 open, but you might also have 49,153, 54, 55, all doing other things at other servers on the internet. Well, it's the same as the server. The server can also reply on different ports for different protocols. Okay. Now, we come to something called the three-way handshake, and this is how the transmissions are uh, set up on a network because we can't just assume we can communicate. If I walk into a room and I just say, okay, guys, you must listen to me now, people may not listen to me. They might not even speak the same language as me. So before we can communicate, we have to request that we can communicate. Right, we now start with the three-way handshake. So when we've got two hosts that want to communicate on a network using TCP, a connection needs to be established before either of these hosts can send uh, or can, can communicate with each other. And this process is called the three-way handshake. And how this process works is as follows. First, the first host, called this host A, sends a synchronizing segment to host B. Now, keep in mind, we have something called SIC, which is short for sequence number, and you see it says 100. Now, sequence number is not necessarily a starting from 1 or from 0. As you can see, this is a random, just randomly selected number, and it happens to be 100. But thereafter, it will have to be 101, 102, 103. So the beginning point is irrelevant as long as you numerically increment by one after that. So the first sequence number happens to be 100, and there comes this segment to host B. Now, host B has received it. There it says uh, the, the synchronizing uh, segment was received, and host B replies by sending a SNAC. A, 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 its own synchronizing uh, segment, but also an acknowledgement. Now, look carefully at what we have here. We have sequence 300. Now, do you see this is sequence 100 and this is sequence 300? So, sequence 100 is the number, the, the first segment's number of host A's communication, while host B's first uh, segment sent starts on 300. So that means that host B will increment 300, 301, 302, 303. Do you get that? So host B also needs to acknowledge host A's synchronizing segment. So do you see what's happening here? First host A sends its synchronizing segment, but host B replies with its synchronizing segment, but also an acknowledgement. So within this second step, there's an acknowledgement. Now look at the acknowledgement number, ACK 101. Can you see that the acknowledgement is 101, yet the synchronizing uh, segment that was sent from host A was 100? So what does this mean? It means that host B is not only saying it received the synchronizing packet or uh, um, segment, it's saying, I acknowledge that you will be sending 101. It's almost a future view of the communication. It's saying that I acknowledge that you will send 101 or you are now clear to send 101. Do you get that? So therefore, host A now replies with its uh, sequence number 101. As you can see, there it goes. But look what it acknowledges, 301. Why does it acknowledge 301? It acknowledges 301 because that was the first 
segment number, sequence number for host B's uh, communication. You see the first, very first uh, segment that left host B, there it is. Remember, it's, it's a different color. That's the first segment that left host B. It started on 300. Therefore, if I want, if I'm sitting at host A and I want to acknowledge host B's communication, I acknowledge in the future, 301. I'm now saying, I've received 300, you're free to send me 301. So again, I also respond with a future view. I'm saying 301 or host B, you're clear to send uh, segment 301. So that's it. That is the three-way handshake. Once this has taken place, host A and B m may now communicate with each other um, may, may now communicate with each other freely because the session has been established. Now they'll communicate with each other and send lots and lots of data, but now they want to close the session. Well, closing the session is as follows. If, if host A wishes to close the session, it will send the fin, uh, the fin request, which is saying, I don't wish to send any further data. So there it goes. Then the fin is received from at host B from host A. So the fin is received and it says send ACK. So then uh, host A now acknowledges the ACK received and look what it happens again. Host B then also sends send fin. You see, so what happens here is host A sends its request to finish the communication. Host B sends its acknowledgement. Thereafter, straight away, it sends its request to close the session. And there we have host A now replying, saying, send ACK, ACK received, session terminated. And that's it. Now, while I've got Wireshark open here, and if you're wondering what Wireshark is, this is a software which you can use or an application you can use to, to see what is happening on a network. It's, we, we used to call it a packet sniffer. And why we call it that is it allows us to see what is flowing in our network through the, well, wireless or Ethernet. Now, you can go and uh, download it from a website called wireshark.org. And you can choose the version you use. I, I use the 64-bit. All right, so install it. And this is what the interface looks like. You've got a, <laughs> a funny looking uh, shark button there. So we say continue without saving. And then you've got a stop button here to stop. So what it is doing, it is looking at um, your various interfaces. You see, I have, I, maybe I should just start this afresh. Um, Let's just start this afresh. Here it is. Okay. And what it's going to do is it's going to ask you which interface you want it to sniff or to look at or to analyze. Can you see I've got a local area connection, I've got a Wi-Fi, but nothing's being transmitted on it. I've got an Ethernet and Ethernet. I've got a dub. My motherboard has two Ethernet connections. So can you see there it's showing me data is, is uh, flowing. So I want to uh, analyze this interface. I could do the Wi-Fi if I enable the Wi-Fi on my computer, but because the Wi-Fi is offline, there's no point. So let's just look at Ethernet 2. So I have to select the interface. So that's what I'm trying to show you here. You're literally selecting which uh, network interface you're using. So this I'm now using my um, LAN connection. So this happens to be Ethernet data coming through the Ethernet. And let's just do a TCP search. So I've just typed in TCP. And that allows me to only find TCP packets. Did you see I just clicked there, enter? And these are only TCP packets. And let's just double click on one of them. Now, while we're looking at Wireshark, can you see the OSI layers here? Okay, so that's supposed to be uh, layer one. This is layer two. This is the layer of Ethernet. And that is why there's MAC addresses here. We don't see IP addresses here because Ethernet uh, is the layer of MAC. Whereas layer 3 is the layer of IP. That is why I'm seeing IP addresses. But nevertheless, this tutorial or this um, lecture is on layer 4. And that is the TCP layer. And this is the layer of the ports. And here I want to show you the acknowledgement number. Can you see there's the acknowledgement number? And let's see if we can find the sequence number. Look at that. This just happens to be sequence number one. I don't know how lucky that was. But I, mean, I did say to you, it doesn't, uh, the TCP doesn't have to start on one. So this was most probably, well, the, the, this was most probably the first um, 
uh, a segment that left or was received from my computer and there's the acknowledgement. I'm acknowledging the receipt of it. Can you see how it's built into the header of the um, segment? Let's look at another TCP. Um, there we go, another one, sequence number one. Let's look at some more TCP maybe further down. There we go. So there we have sequence number 160. And remember I said it does not mean it's the 160th segment. No, it could. this could even be the first one. And then there's acknowledgement number. So you see how I'm showing it to you in the uh, Wireshark interface on layer 4, because that is the transport layer. Look at the ports. Source port, that is the port from where the uh, segment arrived. Uh, 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 was generated from and the destination where it was going look look that looks like email and let's just uh, out of interest look at a UDP datagram and there happens to be a UDP now let's look at the layer 4 what do you notice no sequence number no acknowledgement number proving to you that the UDP um, protocol does not look at those things it does not process them because it's not a reliable form of transmission. Now, okay, so this is just the tutorial. Now, let's move forward and have a look at the, the TCP and the reordering of these segments. Now, earlier I said that TCP will chop up the data. As you can see, all these segments, you see it was a block of data, and it chopped it up into more manageable sizes, and this, th these frames that leave your computer may take a, a variety of routes to the host or to the um, other person you're communicating with. And therefore, they might um, be received at the other person in an odd order. You see, one, two, six, five, four, three. But they weren't sent like that. I sent them one, two, three, four, five, six. So look at this, one, two, six, five, four, three. So TCP needs to reorganize them. So it has a buffer because it puts them in memory while it reorganizes. So one will go straight to one. Two is, is allowed as is. But look here, six has to be buffered or put on a back burner or put in on hold, which means it has to be stored in memory while we wait for the packet number or the segment number three. There, three came last. So that means six, five, and four all needed to be held in a buffer while TCP reorganized that segment one, two, three, four, five, six, and that's the end result. And that's what I was talking about earlier about having to pause the communication. And that is why this is not that useful for voice or video transmissions because we don't want to pause real life or live information. Okay, now just uh, this is coming to the end and I'll just like to show you a final, I think two uh, final things. Let's just have a look at this animation. I'm sending this file with FTP. There it goes. There happens to be an FTP server. The server acknowledges it by sending an acknowledgement segment there. Now you receive that acknowledgement and you're free to send more. You see how that works. But did you see there was an error that crept in there? There was a little error there. See, um, he sent and he never received the acknowledgement. Look. He sent, but the web server did not acknowledge. So therefore, he sent again. Then the web server acknowledges, and then he can send. Uh, then he, he he's notified, and that's what tells us uh, it's reliable. And the narrative on the side here is just saying that TCP is very specific. For example, if you sent uh, an entire block or an entire cluster of segments, say you send. 1,500 to 3,000, so literally you send uh, uh, segments, 1,500 all the way up to 3,000, so that would be 1,500 segments. And then, and then you send 3,400 and three, to 3,500 were, were only acknowledged. So what does this mean? It means that TCP will not s just carry on um, and go and say, okay, I'll send um, uh, the next increment. No, it will go back to the, f the last reliably accepted or received um, segment. So let me say this in another way, because I don't think that was very clear. If, for example, 
here we go. I send you um, 1,500 uh, segments. There we go. 1,500. And then I send you another 1,500. So that means the last one is number 3,000. So that means you must acknowledge me by saying 3,001. Fine. But what happens if the second batch that I sent, you never got? And you only acknowledge 1,501. Well, I have to then continue only on the one that you acknowledged. So if you acknowledge 1,501, well, then I may only start sending 1,501. I cannot go and send 3,001 because I never got acknowledgement of 3,001. So TCP is not allowed to let any packet go astray. And the process that this follows is windowing. So remember that it doesn't acknowledge every single packet, one, 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 one. It acknowledges them in cluster sizes or in a window size. So it will tell the receiver, I'm sending a size of 3,000, which means you should expect 3,000 um, uh, segments. So that allows us to adjust the uh, rate at which we transmit. So if I say to you, I'm sending 3,000 and you only receive 2,400, well, that tells me that this transmission channel can, can, has only got scope or bandwidth enough for 2,400. You get that. So that's the windowing. And um, if you send too much and you exceed the bandwidth of the, uh, the, uh, the medium, well, then it, it, those packets will go, these uh, segments will go lost and then you'll just have to resend them. So this is uh, based, uh, this is a real time thing because the loading on our networks and the congestion, the congestion, the load, you know, the loading, the reliability and so forth, um, the state, whether they're offline, or online, these things change dynamically. And the paths that the, um, the uh, segments travel around the network, well, that also changes dynamically. So we have to keep adjusting the window size. And uh, I think that brings us to the end the last thing was just the UDP, and that was showing you that I sent the UDP as in the order of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and it happened to be received 1, 2, 6, 5, 4, and guess what? There's nothing you can do about it, and that is just the nature of UDP. So that brings me to the end of this very long uh, uh, lecture on the transport layer, and I hope it was helpful, and thanks for watching. Cheers.